Well, today we are getting back into our Hymn Hysteria sermon series. With a look at a hymn, we're going to sing in just a little bit. Have thine own way, Lord. It got to the Elite Eight of our bracket contest. It defeated Shall We Gather at the River, Hymn of Promise, and Stand Up for Jesus. The words to Have Thine Own Way, Lord, were written by Adelaide A. Pollard in 1902. Now, Adelaide A. Pollard was actually born as Sarah Addison Pollard. She was born in Bloomfield, Iowa. She did not care for the name Sarah, eventually adopted the name Adelaide. She was a very humble woman. There are no pictures of her that I could find. In fact, I read that often she would not even put her name on the poems and hymns that she wrote because she did not want any attention for herself. She attended Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, eventually went to New York, trained there to be a missionary. She wanted to do mission work in Africa, but she did not have the money to get there. She was at a prayer service one evening. She heard an elderly woman say, it really doesn't matter what you do with us, Lord. Just have your own way with our lives. And that reminded her of Jeremiah 18.6, which we just read, where God says, Can I not do with you, house of Israel, as this potter does? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. She's said to have written over a hundred other hymns, but this one is the only one that really became famous. It remains prominent to this day. Have thine own way, Lord. The tune we have was written in 1907 by George C. Stebbins, who also had a connection to the Moody Bible Institute, was a well-known Christian musician and songwriter in his day. Mr. Stebbins also wrote the tune to Take Time to Be Holy, which, of course, is also in our hymn. Now, in looking at why it is we like Have Thine Own Way, Lord, it's interesting to look at that passage that Ms. Pollard based her poem on. In that reading, God is speaking through Jeremiah, and he says, I, basically says, I will have my own way. I am the potter. You are just the clay in my hands. Whatever I say goes. When I say a nation or kingdom is going to be destroyed, then it will be unless it does something to make me change my mind. And when I say a nation or kingdom is going to be built up, then it will be, unless it does something to make me change my mind. God says things happen the way I say they're going to happen. And that's it. This passage from Jeremiah is a statement from God. It's a warning about God's power. That power is power that God just has because God is God. God does not ask for any permission to use that power. God does not care whether we human beings like it. God uses that power. God's not interested in our opinion as to how God uses God's power. The way God comes across in Jeremiah is that God will use God's power in whatever way God thinks is right. And so the kingdoms and nations of this world had better be careful. If those kingdoms and nations get on God's bad side, God will use God's power in a way that may be fair and just. But it's a way those kingdoms and nations won't like very much. But that's not what the hymn says. Even though she based it on that passage, it's not what our hymn says. The hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, invites God to have God's way. It asks God to have God's way. It wants God to use God's power. And it does not talk about nations and kingdoms. It talks about us as individuals. It says, I am the clay. Mold me. Make me. I'll just humbly and quietly wait for you to do whatever it is you want to do. You have the power, God. Use it however you want to. The hymn begs God to take control of our lives, to fill us so full of the Holy Spirit that everyone can see Jesus Christ living in us. And I think that's why the hymn is so popular. Because we know that is what we're supposed to do. We know this is how we are supposed to feel. The song tells us the way Christians are supposed to be. We're supposed to give up our own wants and our own desires and be totally submissive to God and to God's will. And of course we read that in other places in the Bible too. The prime example of it that I always think of is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane knowing that he is about to be arrested and 
tortured and killed. Not wanting to go through that any more than the rest of us would want to. But knowing that it's God's will that he do that. And saying to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. It's what we pray every week in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We know this is the attitude we're supposed to have, where we just put our own will completely aside and simply go wherever God wants us to go and do whatever God wants us to do. If only it was that simple. Well, you know, that's really not the way to put it because it is simple, just not easy. It's not that it's a hard thing to understand, it's that it's a hard thing for us to actually do. Think about it. What would it mean for your life or for my life if God molded us and made us after God's will? What would happen if we simply waited, yielded and still, as the song says, for God to do with us whatever God wants to do? What would, be, what would we be doing right now if God had absolute control, absolute sway, as the song says, over my life or over your life? What would it be like if we were so full of the Holy Spirit that everyone could see Jesus Christ only and always living in each one of us? Now those are not just rhetorical questions. Those are questions we need to ask ourselves. We need to answer them. When we sing this song, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, we need to ask ourselves if we really mean that. Do we really want God to have God's way with our lives? Or is it just kind of a nice thought? Something that sounds good, but that we're never really going to do anything about. It's an important question, and the reason it is so important is that if we go to God and pray this with an honest and a sincere and open heart, God will answer that prayer. When we come to God openly and honestly and sincerely, emptied of all of our selfish wants and desires to the extent that's humanly possible, and truly ask God to take control of our lives, God will do it. God will do just that. God sometimes, I think, is waiting for us to do that. And when we do it, and God answers that prayer, we never know what might happen. For Adelaide Pollard, it led her not to Africa where she wanted to go, but to Scotland, where she did missionary work after World War I. A few years back, it led a lawyer in Wessington Springs, South Dakota, to become a United Methodist pastor. Now, I'm not saying I always open myself up to God that way, because a lot of times I don't, but the one time I did... God took my life in a direction I never thought it would go. And that's the thing. You see, we don't have to do this perfectly. We don't have to do this all the time. That's the goal, of course. That would be a good thing for us. It's what we're trying to do. But even if we don't, even if we just do it once in a while, in fact, even if we just do it once, if we just one time Go to God with an open and sincere heart and ask God to do whatever God wants to do with our lives. God will use that one time we do that to completely change our lives. Adelaide Potter wrote these words when she was going through what she termed a distress of soul. And sometimes that's what it takes for us to, get, to really let God have control of our lives. When things are going well, or even when things are not going exceptionally well, but just kind of okay, we tend to not want to make any changes. We don't want to rock the boat or upset the apple cart or whatever cliche it is that you like to use. Sometimes it takes us being miserable, being depressed, feeling that distress of soul that Adelaide Pollard felt before we're really willing turn our lives over to God. And that's understandable. I'm sure God understands it too, but you know, 
It's really kind of sad. Sad because it shows a lack of trust in God. It shows we don't have enough faith to believe that God would give us something better. To believe that God wants us to have something better. To believe that God wants us to be something better. It's not sad because we're hurting God. It's sad because we're hurting ourselves. When we don't give control of our lives to God, we don't become everything that God wants us to become. We settle for okay, for good enough, for could be worse. Rather than having the full and satisfying and complete lives that God wants us to have. Because after all, we say that God loves us, right? And we believe that, don't we? I hope we do. And if God really loves us, if we really believe that God loves us, then if a loving God would want what's best for us, right? So if we give God control of our lives, then it only makes sense that God would lead us to what's best for us that God would make us the people God wants us to be, the people that God created us to be. And that's an awesome thing to think about. We don't have to settle for less than that. The only reason we settle for less is because it's a choice that we're making. You and I, and I make it too. The reason we settle for less is because we don't trust God enough to give God control of our lives. So let's not settle anymore. Let's stop settling. Let's go to God openly and honestly. Let's empty ourselves of our selfish wants and our desires. Let's ask God to have God's way with us. We may not know what will happen when we do, but if we trust God, we know it'll be something awesome and incredible. So let's stand and sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And let's really mean what those words say. Wash me just now. 
Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> 